Good morning. Welcome to our Bible study this morning. This morning we'll be looking at part number five in our series on Halloween. This is the final part. What I would like us to do this morning is to simply take time to summarize everything we've seen about the Halloween celebration and the Halloween uh, history of Halloween and in doing so try to answer a few questions from the Bible concerning what the Lord thinks of these things. Remember, the text we've been looking at on every part of this lesson is found in 1 Thessalonians 5, 21 and 22. This is our responsibility as Christians given to us by our Lord. Prove all things. In other words, put everything to the test. Hold fast that which is good. Abstain from all appearance of evil. As we put Halloween to the test, our responsibility as Christians is to decide whether it's something that's good or something that's evil. If it's good, we should cling to it. We should participate in it. If we find it's something that's evil, we should abstain from it. But again, these verses even go a step farther. Even if we find it's not evil in and of itself, if it appears like evil, we should abstain from it as well. So as Christians, I would ask each one of us to please take these things to the Lord. Ask Him for His will to be done concerning what us and our families should do concerning participating in Halloween. Okay, let's first of all quickly review what we've seen about Halloween in the past four lessons. Remember in lesson one we looked at the history of Halloween. We learned that Halloween's history is connected with the belief that the spirits of dead men walk on the earth, that Halloween's observance was done in preparation for a time of worship to the Lord of Darkness, and also a part of the Halloween celebration involved honoring and appeasing the spirits of dead men who were walking on the earth. That was the beliefs and that was the motives behind uh, the October 31st celebration that became known as Halloween. In part number two of our series we looked at the death symbols of Halloween. That involved ghosts, jack-o'-lanterns, vampires, bats, and Frankenstein. We said all of those are connected in one way or another to the spirits of the dead which do not immediately go to their eternal state. They're allowed to dwell on the earth. So in all of those different ones as we looked at them, each one of them involved the idea of people dying but their spirits remaining on the earth in one way, shape, or form or another. In part number three of our study, we studied the sorcery symbols connected with Halloween. That's things like witches, black cats, spiders, werewolves, and full moons. We said each one of those were related to the casting of magical spells and incantations. Also, a part of what was involved was the worship of false gods through idols. Both the full moon, if you remember, and black cats were different representations of the goddess Diana and how people worshipped that goddess. It was all a part of the Wiccan religion. <clears throat> Finally, in part four of our study, we looked at the necromancy symbols of Halloween. These included the seances and the Ouija boards. And if you remember, in both cases, those involved the idea of commuting, com I'm sorry, communicating with the spirits of dead men who were still walking on the earth. So when you take into account the history of Halloween, the celebration itself, along with all the different symbolism involved with Halloween, the different characters involved and what they symbolize and how they began and what they are involved with, we find that everything is connected to the occult. Everything is connected to the idea of death in one way, shape, or form. And especially it's the idea that at death the spirits of human beings are able to roam the earth instead of being commended into the hands of their God. Almost everything about Halloween in one way, shape, or form is involved with that. With the idea of spells and the idea of incantations. With the idea of 
worshiping the Lord of Darkness. All of these different things. So what I would like us to do now, realizing all of that, I would like us to answer just a few questions that come from the Bible concerning this holiday that we call Halloween. Question number one. Are we separating ourselves from the sins of this world by participating in the Halloween festival? We really need to answer that question. Between you and, and you and the Lord, we all need to come before the Lord and ask Him, Lord, by me participating in the Halloween festival, however I choose to participate, is that separating myself from the sin of this world? You can get all the references to this in my blog, though I, I give different verses and all where we get these questions from. Number two, is our level of involvement in Halloween considered conforming or fashioning ourselves to this world? Remember, a big part of the issue isn't actually committing the sins that Halloween stands for. It's simply the appearance of evil. Again, I'll use the example of, you know, dressing up like an axe murderer. We can dress up as an axe murderer for Halloween. That doesn't mean we're going to literally go out and be an axe murderer. We're not at all accusing people. Just like I'm not accusing anybody. If you partake in a Halloween celebration, you become an idol worshiper. Yeah, that's foolishness. To say that somebody automatically becomes an idol worshiper by participating in Halloween is wrong. That's not the case. Or saying that because we go to a Halloween party, that makes us wanting to communicate with the spirits of dead people. Not at all. Nobody ever said that. What we're saying, though, is this. By participating in a Halloween celebration, does it make us, does it take, a, do we take upon ourselves the appearance of evil? Again, getting back to the axe murderer thing. If I dress as an axe murderer, I'm the first to say I'm not going to go out and kill somebody with an axe. But what does that appear like to people? When I dress up as an axe murderer, does that affect my testimony as a Christian at all? When I take upon myself the character of someone who has committed a sin, a gross, vile, heinous sin, does that do anything to my character at all? That's what the question really is. The question is, is the appearance of evil being brought upon myself by doing these things? Verse number, or the third question I've got, is the Halloween celebration spotting our testimony for the Lord? The Lord talks about in James, he talks about us spotting our garments. Participating in the Halloween celebration, is that spotting our garments for the Lord? How about number four? Is our participation in Halloween causing our weaker brothers to stumble in their walk for Christ? In other words, are they encouraged to make bad life choices because of the example we're setting? Boy, that's an important one too. You know, Paul says there are some things that for a Christian are, uh, we have the freedom to do those things, except when we stop and think about how it will affect others. The example that's used in the Bible is, back in those days they had idol worshippers that would sacrifice animals to their idols. Well, a part of what would happen, too, is they would take a part of the meat that, that wasn't sacrificed with an animal and they would eat it. So Paul is asked the question, okay, Paul, if an idol worshiper comes up to you and offers you a piece of meat to eat that had been formally sacrificed to an idol, would you eat it? Paul's statement was, look, we know that that piece of meat is just that. It's a piece of meat. Those idols are nothing. We serve the true God. So I don't care if that meat was sacrificed to an idol or not. As far as for me as a Christian, independently alone in this world, I could eat that meat and nothing would happen to me because the idols are nothing. But he said the problem with me eating the meat is, if a weaker brother or sister in Christ watches me eat the meat, they might misinterpret that to mean Paul's partaking in the sacrificing of two idols. The Paul's a part of that, so it must be okay for us to because he is. So Paul says because he didn't want to make his brother stumble, or because he didn't want to offend his brother, it was better he just didn't eat the meat. That way there's no question about Paul participating in sacrifices to idols. 
That's kind of how it is with the Halloween festival. We've got to ask ourselves a question. Even though we know better than these things, like we know vampires don't exist. We know werewolves don't exist. We know the spirits of dead men don't walk on the earth. We know that as Christians. The Bible is plain about all those things. Even though we know it, if a weaker brother or sister sees us involved in a Halloween celebration, is there some way they can misinterpret that to mean maybe spirits do work on the earth? walk on the earth. See, you know, we have to be careful how our testimony affects the lives of others. So even though we, perhaps as Christians who have a good knowledge of God's word, understand all this stuff is foolishness. As far as like the, you know, the vampire stuff and the werewolf stuff and all, it's just a bunch of foolishness. You know, it's kind of a joke thing, kind of fun to watch every now and then. It's stupid. But what about a person who really doesn't understand these things that believes maybe vampires do exist? Maybe, you know, maybe werewolves do exist. Should we refrain from messing with any of these things during a Halloween celebration so we don't mislead others? See, that's the question that's involved. Can our participation in Halloween be done for the Lord's glory? In 1 Corinthians 10, the Bible says everything that we do, we should do for the Lord's glory. Can we honestly come before the Lord and say, Lord, tonight I'm going to dress up like a vampire for your glory. Tonight I'm going to dress up like a, uh, like, again, like an axe murderer for your glory. Finally, when we are participating in this celebration, can we be having our minds on that which is true, honest, just, etc.? Philippians 4 talks about what a Christian should be thinking about. Think about things that are true, honest, just, and the list goes on and on in, in Philippians 4. Can we say that when we're participating in a Halloween celebration like that, that's what our minds are on? Again, this is between each Christian and their Lord. We need to be serious and ask the Lord, Lord, am I doing what's right as we go through these? Now, finally, let me give you four options. As a pastor over the years, I've seen Christian families handle Halloween in a lot of different ways. Looking back now, I put these into basically four categories of different ways I've seen Christians handle this. The first way is simply participate totally. I mean, they held nothing back. They would dress like vampires. They would go to Halloween celebrations. They would trick or treat. They would do about anything the Halloween had to offer they were a part of. The second thing I've seen Christian families do is this. They would participate in Halloween, like going to the parties, trick-or-treating. They would do those things, but they would be sure that they would dress in benign costumes. Things like cowboys and ballerinas and uh, uh, maybe clowns. That type of thing. Instead of dressing up in wicked outfits like vampires and werewolves and things that stood for wickedness, they just made sure that their costumes were benign. But they would still go ahead and go to the celebrations. They would still trick or treat. They would still do all those other things. It's just the way that they would dress would be different. So they wouldn't be worrying and taking upon themselves the character of wicked men. There's a third thing that I've noticed. Some Christian families, they participate in things like harvest parties and fall parties where they don't have anything to do with Halloween, but they simply go to parties around the same time of the year and they take their kids to those type of parties. Okay, but it has nothing really to do with Halloween. It's just other parties that take place about that time of the year, kind of as a substitute for Halloween party. Then there were those other families who simply said, look, we're going to pretend like Halloween doesn't even exist. They would have nothing to do with anything about Halloween. They would have nothing to do with harvest parties or anything. They, it was just like there was no such holiday as Halloween is how they would look at it. It was just another day. They would go to work. They would come home. You know, let's say Halloween was on a Friday that year. Whatever they normally did on Fridays, they did. They would come home, come home from work, go to a, the high school football game. Whatever they normally would do, they would just keep doing it. It would be like Halloween did not exist. Those are basically the four different options that I know of that a Christian has. <clears throat> Just in real basic terms. The question is this. What's the right option? I'm not, it's not in my place to tell you what the right option is. I know what's right for my life. And I talk about that in the blog more. But what I'm saying is, for each Christian, we have to approach the Lord as individuals and ask Him to lead, us, lead and guide us in this issue. Thank you very much for putting up with a five-part series. May the Lord bless you.